Hi, welcome, and thank you for waiting. My name is Nina Gaby, and I'm very excited um, to be able to introduce Dr. David Tomas. Um, and just, I need to tell you, I did not write this introduction, but it's so adorable that I decided that we, we decided that he wouldn't be embarrassed by it, and, and I'd go ahead and read it as is. You can blame the organizer, Rick Kasonic, for the accolades. So David La Tomas, David La Tomas is a philosopher, cognitive scientist, psychotherapist, author, artist, and faculty member working and teaching at the University of Vermont UVM Medical Center, Community College of Vermont, uh, CRAM Research Center, and Sophia University. Born in South Tyrol, the trilingual autonomous region of Northern Italy. Dr. Tomas has received multiple degrees and awards in a broad range of research areas, including theoretical medicine, neuroscience, psychology, philosophy of mind, ethno-linguistics, and religion. David's current research focuses on critical neuroscience, the mind-body problem, and the hard problem of consciousness. Dr. Tomas also works with the scientists Goddard, Marini, Peters, and Virbichka on the research project Linguistics Interface Applying the Natural Semantic Meta-Language NSM to Narrative Medicine, and on multiple projects in the areas of psychiatry, medical ethics, and integrative health at the University of Vermont. As an artist, David Tomas has worked in European and American theaters, museums, and private public institutions with multiple media, including drawing, painting, photography, installation, performance art, video, theater, and music, and now he's published the groundbreaking work, Medical Philosophy, which we're here to launch today. Will you please join me in saying, that's way too much talent for one man. <laughs> Never mind the fact that he's good looking too. Let's just give him the Nobel and get it over with. For now, though, I give you the disconcertingly humble, unassuming, and actually extremely charming David Lod Tomas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's good that John did it for me, so I can play back to my wife. I will compliment everybody. Um, Thank you for coming. Uh, there are people from all over um, the world really here. I'm really glad to see uh, um, a lot of my friends, all of my colleagues, and a lot of people that actually made the book and the research contained this book possible. Because as much as I am the author of this book, the content of the book is really based upon some of the research I had the luxury to conduct at UVM Medical Center, especially in the inpatient psychiatry unit. So, um, before I start with the description of what the book is about, I would like to say thank you to um, the following, the following, let's uh, see, <clears throat> yes, let's see, turn it on and off again, here you go. So, I would like to say thank you to the Bronson Book Festival, to the University of Vermont Medical Center, the Leonard College of Medicine, the College of Nursing and Health Sciences, the Department of Leadership and Developmental Sciences, CCD, the College of Vermont, University of Sofia, um, the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, and my publisher, Ibn Farlak in Germany, and Columbia University Press. So, medical philosophy. Um, this is a textbook that tries to combine theoretical approaches in medicine and the analysis of the scientific method. However, the most important area we will focus here is psychiatry and psychology. Not just because that's my primary affiliation, but because I thought that by analyzing the issues and the structure of medical um, practice in psychiatry, we will have 
the wonderful opportunity to better understand what it means to be a patient, but first of all, what it means to be a person. And you know, patient-centered medicine is actually what we're trying to um, focus on in our everyday practice. Um, I would like also to thank uh, all the staff um, at the um, Inpatient Psychiatry Unit that made this research possible. I saw a lot of you here, so thank you for coming. And um, I also would like to define what the issue at hand here is. So, this is something that I thought when I was trying to um, come out with a cover for the book, which is a question mark and a stethoscope, thanks to Sonia right there. And um, it's this combination between the question we're trying to ask and what this question means in terms of medical practice. So, since this is a book about philosophy, it's about psychology, we have to start from um, the table of content. So here is the content of the book. So um, in the first chapter, we uh, covered a brief history of medical philosophy, and already we should make a distinction here. This is a book on medical philosophy and not philosophy of medicine, which is not just a nice way to complicate things because philosophers oftentimes like their sound of their voice, but it's simply to define the question. So, if in uh, philosophy of medicine, the analysis on, is on the that or on the what, in medical philosophy, the analysis is on the how. So, in other words, instead of just focusing on the statistical analysis of the scientific method, we focus on the person with its complexity and its multi-layered essence. So, in, in the first chapter, we cover the history uh, and the uh, um, connection um, of medicine with art, science, and technology, and the last part, self-image, academic achievement, and healing process. So, um, I would like to think of medicine as defined as three, these three elements, and it's not uh, something I came up with, I cannot claim to define art in this sense, is actually um, coming from Aristotle and philosophy. So Aristotle was the first one that defined science in a threefold way. So science as techne, which was actually the technique and technology, so the ability to convey data based on scientific um, evaluation, and science as an art, so medicine especially definitely fits into this category, and finally, science um, as episteme and phronesis. Episteme will be pretty much the equivalent of science the way it's understood in English. While phronesis contains a more ethical aspect. So we do science not only to ameliorate the general outlook on what we don't know yet, but we do science also to improve our sense of self in connection to others. And in medicine, especially in psychiatry, a field in which there are a lot of things left unspoken, untold, because we can only base our analysis on the um, symptomatology of the patient, based on what we observe, art and phrenosis, it's really, really important. I will not read the whole table of content, not to bore you already, um, but there are seven chapters, and each chapter focuses on one specific way to look at the problem. Okay, so in the first, uh, Three chapters you have kind of the brief history, the second part is hermeneutics and evidence based medicine, and chapter three is neuroscience and phenomenology. Now, this is not a lecture on either philosophy or neuroscience, and I'm not assuming that uh, those terms might be familiar to all of you. Um, by um, the first term, hermeneutics is actually intended a further analysis or interpretation of the text, and it's often used for texts that have to do with either sacred content, biblical sources, aesthetic sources, etc. Versus for um, phenomenology, um, the term defines a philosophical um, approach that was first uh, discussed in depth by Hegel and then Heidegger. <coughs> For chapter four, again, the patient at the center of therapy. Chapter five, complementary alternative traditional medicine. Chapter six, beyond the realm of this world, which is not a title for a Hollywood movie, but it's really the introduction to the research, the clinical research we conducted on a unit. And the research was actually part of our attempt to better understand the patient from the perspective of his or her own belief system, which we will see in a second. 
second. The third part is translational science, uh, which is a very fancy term to simply define what uh, information we gather by the application of the scientific method in the laboratory to you know, the application to the everyday life. So we do science not because we feel good about doing science, or part of it's true, we do science to improve our lives. Okay. So this is um, pretty much the content. The last part of the appendix is the empirical research conducted at UBM. So we have to start from the brain. And, and the reason why I chose this image is because um, I am a strong supporter of doing things um, by hand. And I'm, I love calligraphy and I love drawing things. And aside because it feels good, I feel it's also the best way to memorize things. And I do that with my students as well. So um, here comes my wife. Welcome, welcome. Um, and my little one. So I got it again. Um, so we are focusing on the brain here because the biggest assumption we have in, uh, in psychiatry is that there is such thing as a separation between mind and brain. And this is a philosophical assumption that makes sense only if you already discuss the possible um, outcomes of either a materialistic and nihilistic orientation or a monotic uh, orientation. So, why do we think that we have two different aspects of our personality? On one side you have the body, the physical mechanism, the processes in the brain, and the other part is something that's really hard to define depending on what your system of belief might be either mind in a sense of you know, psychological processes or soul even, or self. And as much as there is really no way to scientifically demonstrate the existence of the second part by science intended as the scientific method and the um, primacy of observation and the principle of falsifiability, Nevertheless, if you want to talk to a patient, whether you know, in the form of uh, psychotherapy or as a nurse, as a group therapist, as a psychiatrist, etc., the assumption is that this patient has a sense of self that he or she can use to change their outlook in life. On the other side, however, if there is no such thing as a self or as a mind, and this is just a social or you know, cultural construct, then we would not be very honest to our patients, in the sense that we are claiming that we can change things, but if those changes cannot happen due to the fact that there's only a material brain, then it's really hard to defend this position. So one of the reasons why I decided to write a book on medical philosophy is because I wanted to be honest with my patients, pretty much. And I also wanted to uh, try to reconnect to the deepest level of their understanding. And um, we do this quite often on the unit and you know, the group therapists that are present here tonight will tell you that we, we really cover a lot of different approaches on our unit from classical psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, all the way to meditation, mindfulness, tai chi, etc. So we are trying to present a picture of a person that goes far beyond um, what is usually intended with classical psychotherapy. So those are just the you know, main areas of the brain, so I will not um, try to be too tedious and bore you with the discussion of, of uh, brain structure, but real quick, um, in, in neuroscience we usually subdivide the brain into areas based on what each of these areas does to the brain. So um, real quick, you have four lobes, you have the frontal lobe right there, the, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe, and each of these lobes are responsible for specific um, mechanism in the brain. Now, uh, without digging too deep in the, in the processes beyond these uh, lobes, the question here is, is it honest to assume that there is such thing as a constant self, and this self is to some extent influenced by the external environment, and in turn, this external environment determines how the self changes, and therefore the self will change, and will change its perception of this environment. It's the old nature versus nurture type of debate. How much we have, um, how much knowledge do we have of who we are, and how much our sense of self changes constantly. 
Now, from the perspective of neuroscience, this is nothing new. Um, we all know that each day our cell pretty much rebuild themselves, cell die and cell are regrow pretty much on a daily basis. Um, however, until fairly recent uh, times, we didn't know that the same was applicable to the brain as well. And even if you're not a you know, psychotherapist or a neuroscientist, you know that there are issues such as Alzheimer's, for instance, Parkinson's disease that we can target, but we can't completely solve, at least not yet. So uh, there seems to be quite evidence for the fact that, unfortunately, if you lose part of your neurological activity and your neurons die, it doesn't seem to be enough evidence that you can recover from that. However, most recent research actually clearly indicated which we never said that research shows or proves, but at least indicated that the, the same thing happens on a neurological level, and that's the field of neuroplasticity, so the ability of the brain to regrow itself in this in terms of pattern. And it's really at the center of our discussion here. So, um, in this book, we try to cover those approaches that take as a philosophical assumption the fact that we do have a mind as a separate entity from the brain. Okay? So let's take a quick look um, at the approaches that are discussed in the book. So, <clears throat> part of my job at UVM is also doing research in the field of integrative health. And this is in itself a quite controversial term. And I want to spend some time discussing that because we live in a um, quite interesting, uh, if not scary time, in, in, in our country, in which science is sometimes viewed as a conspiracy theory. So when we talk about integrative approaches, I want to make sure that we still are embracing our scientific method fully. And we have to start from the definition. So integrative approaches are pretty much the same as complementary approaches, okay? Um, in some cases, even alternative approaches. And there is a department of the National Institute of Health that actually dedicates a huge part of its research to these approaches. So the reason why we use nowadays the term integrative medicine and integrative health is because we want to make sure that we are integrating the scientific method using medicine. We are not attempting to substitute our approaches to medicine, okay, intended in a scientific sense. Because if you think about if something is complementary, it means that what you're trying to complement is not enough. So you're trying to add something that will solve that problem. We're not claiming that medicine is not good enough, on the contrary. And the same thing happens for alternative medicine, okay? By alternative medicine, we don't mean something that's alternative to something that has been dis disregarded in the scientific term. We simply mean something that should go deeper, and that's what we're trying to do here. Um, obviously, this has a lot to do with the current political discourse. Uh, you, know, you know, we have to you know, think of being politically right, but at the same time being scientifically accurate in that sense. So, those are some of the approaches that are discussed in the book. And the discussion in the book is really not about the techniques. Okay, there are a lot of very good resources out there. So, in my book here, I simply want to provide enough evidence in terms of what research studies have been conducted on each of these fields, okay? So the assumption here is nothing should be taken for granted until you have some sort of evidence, okay? And we will return to this term in a little bit. So um, I will not read them all aloud, but um, there are um, some of these approaches that we use even in psychiatry, such as guided imagery, for instance. Um, and there are other approaches, such as um, anthroposophic medicine, for instance, that are implementing what has already been done in classical medicine, anthroposophic medicine. It's a submedical field developed by uh, Rudolf Steiner and it's part of the Waldorf School um, and you know, a kinetics type of um, environment. And, uh, and I also wanted to point out that it's sometimes very difficult not to put a lot of different things in the same basket. Okay? And that's why I included Christian faith healing, religious spiritual healing and shamanism there. Obviously, those are not the same thing. And from the perspective of current science, the movie Curious Science, the first one, Christian faith healing, as defined by that, is unfortunately not as backed up by science as in the case of certain areas of religious spiritual healing. And we'll discuss that a little more in depth. Ethnomedicine and folk medicine and traditional medicine. Um, something I want to mention here is that 
as much as science should be at the center of our discourse here, the assumption that science is something that's completely detached from ourselves or completely um, objective, it's also a misnomer. So in other words, every type of medicine and every type of psychology, it's a folk medicine and folk psychology, in a sense that it's culturally embedded in the here and the now, okay? So I want to give you a, you know, a few examples. Um, um, in, um, in the notes we need to write after a group um, on the unit, one of the things we will write, for instance, is um, how, um, how the patient behaved in terms of um, um, how much uh, the behavior could be standardized in a sense of being considered quote-unquote normal, and one of the, the best examples uh, would be um, the focus, the attentiveness, the um, affect, and all those things are as much as they're you know observable because you are doing group so you observe the patient. They're still pretty much embedded in the way we feel about the patient. So, for instance, how am I to define a per patient's personality based on how much does this person look at me in the eye? Those are very much culturally related issues. Okay. Um, the other thing, something like boundaries, we really try to do our best on our unit to define what boundaries are, and you know, in different cultures, boundaries are you know considered different depending on you know what your personal space might be. And I'm being Italian, you know, my, my personal space is probably inside of this book, so I really have a lot to learn. And, but thanks to my colleague, I, I think I got it at this point. And we. We continue with um, the second part of the interior approaches, again, herbal medicine, physiotherapy, and uh, all the way to meditation, mindfulness, mind-body medicine, <coughs> and medicine. Again, mind-body medicine is, again, based on this philosophical assumption that are two different things, right? Because otherwise, why would you need to connect something that doesn't need to be connected other than one thing, right? And um, in this sense, I would like to um, briefly discuss what the main philosophical assumptions um, in the history of philosophy um, are in regards to medicine. So, on one side, you have a monistic perspective. So, monos is Greek for one, so just one perspective, okay? And you could have two different, different types of monism. On one side, you have a natural monism. By nature, we intend the body, the physical aspect. So, the extreme view in this area would be simply there's no such thing as you know a mind that's separated from the body. Okay, everything is one, and everything is the body. So sure, you can talk about the soul, you can talk about the mind, but in the end, we're just our neurological transmitted information. That's one way of moment. On the other side, uh, moments could be well, you know, whatever we define as matter as body really defines the way we create this definition. So it's kind of a catch-22 here, because the assumption is that you only have a brain, you are your brain, and you're using your brain to define whether you have a brain or not. So this is the monistic part, okay? And again, I'm not trying to make fun of monism. It's a very, very important part of philosophy, especially analytic philosophy. Um, but it's not the only monism we have. Um, some philosophers see monism in a more extreme way, and some philosophers see it in a more, um, I would say, uh, balanced, if you want, or imprecise, depending on whom you ask. So you can have the primacy of the mind or the primacy of the body, okay? And you're kind of halfway between monism and dualism. Dualism is dual, it's Latin for two, right? So two different things, mind on one side, body on the other. But at this point, you have to decide for yourself which one is more important. So is it the mind that controls the body? Is the mind controls of physical processes? Or, as Adrian would say, my son, no, no, it's actually the opposite. It's actually the, the brain that controls the mind. It's the body that controls our feelings and thoughts. Um, now, this is not just a philosophical consideration for, you know, um, experts in philosophy. It really impacts our everyday life. And I want to, you know, give you an example. If we think about the concept of free will, okay, especially in our society, the independency of free will is something we really rely upon in, you know, in most of our, you know, activities during the day. You know, if you think about 
the legal aspect, the ethical aspect. We are free to make choices, and freedom is really an important part of our society. But what if this free will was just a misnomer, just a construct, and in the end it didn't make sense because you thought you were free, but in the end really your body making a decision for you, so it's just some layer. Um, and, and this is something that would you know, keep me awake at night, uh, if my son wouldn't do this already. Um, because it's really, really important to understand that it has a straightforward impact in our ability of getting better. Let's say you have a patient that's suffering from depression, for instance. If the assumption is that there is such thing as free will, if you're doing a good job as a therapist, as a nurse, as a psychiatrist, now this person can incorporate some of those teachings, some of those skills, make it her own or his own, and then use it in the everyday life to change the way they think about life. For instance, working on cognitive distortion, these type of things. But if free will doesn't exist, it doesn't really matter what you're doing, because it's not really you that are doing it, it's your brain, and this other person's brain is very different, so you're kind of stuck there. You can say a lot of nice words that actually might work in the immediate um, outcome, but you're actually fooling yourself. This is not my point of view, obviously. I actually uh, have a strong support of the existence of free will. Um, and there are a lot of interesting research conducted on the neurological aspect of free will. So one of the, the main experiments simply tells that if free will existed, okay, if I am trying to stimulate uh, your brain to you know, have a specific action so that you can grab an item or you can respond to a test in a certain way and you do that, then the assumption is that while I made you do it, me as a researcher, by stimulating your brain, okay, and if you just followed, that means that you didn't have a complete free will. On the other side, what's quite interesting, and this is covered in the book, it's quite complex, so I will not you know, discuss that in depth here, whether you believe in free will or not will actually determine how fast you're going to be in your responses. Okay, just kind of interesting. So, in other words, I'm not sure if it will exist or not, but if I believe it exists, then it will. If I don't believe it exists, it won't. Okay? And this is from the perspective of specific outcomes, right? Okay. Um, the last part of the context um, focuses on um, different areas, and those are only in alphabetical order, not in order of importance for sure. Um, and I would like to focus on the last three, the traditional one, the Chinese medicine, the European medicine, Tibetan medicine. Uh, because um, they um, are representative of very, very different approaches, and it's something that's, again, cultural bound. Thank you. Um, just taking this mind, right? Projecting my own psychological process. Out. So, uh, Chinese and Tibetan medicine share, I would say, a good percentage of common attitudes to our nature and to the natural healing power that the body has. But if you dig deeper, they're very much different. The same can be said by European medicine, which is sometimes used interchangeably for naturopathy or Heilkunde, or Neue Deutsche Heilkunde, um, which is the traditional folk medicine that was found you know, throughout Europe, Central and Eastern Europe. And, um, and again, Everything here is an internal approach to medicine, so the assumption again is that you can do something with your mind. Now, in the next slide here, we will focus on the research here. So what, what is this research about? What, what was I trying to uh, investigate in, in this book? Well, we do um, have a focus group on the patient psychiatry unit, and the focus group is uh, pretty much a patient satisfaction survey, and we just work on that newest edition, next to things in another. So, um, this is really important because we need to verify um, if we are doing a good job, also knowing that sometimes if you are actually doing a good job, that means that you will get bad reviews because that's part of being in this field. So, in this research, we attach a second part to the focus group, and the second part was actually this health perception survey, okay? And it was really focused on those elements that are not immediately measurable with the scientific method, so we're not measuring BMI, we're not measuring heart rate or oxygenation level, we measure <laughs> qualitative data about patients, and 
most of the research should include quantitative approaches and qualitative approaches. Quantitative approaches are pretty much you know, focus on numbers and levels, okay? Qualitative approaches are, to some extent, the comparison between multiple choice and open uh, questions in, in a quiz that you do um, in, in high school or in college. So, I also want to stress here that um, our um, reliance on science should also be mindful of the fact that statements such as, well, you should trust the data because numbers don't lie, well, that is itself quite controversial because numbers don't lie because numbers don't tell the truth either. N numbers are just numbers, okay? So it's really our interpretation of the scientific data that really matters, whether it's in a statistical analysis type of spectrum, epidemiological type of spectrum, but there's no way you can take the human part outside of science, and that's a really fundamental element, okay? And th the more we understand the process, the more we will actually embrace science, because we will not be afraid of science as something that will undermine our ethics, our morality, our sense of beliefs, or even spirituality. We could embrace science fully, because we are not going to be threatened by it. So, <clears throat> Those are the scales, you know, uh, rates your answer based on this uh, Likert life scale from absolutely disagree and absolutely agree. And uh, I, think, I have to thank Luca Lasanti here for his guidance in, the, in, that, uh, in that scale. Thank you. Um, and um, this is the first part of the, the survey. So, uh, factors that affect your health and how much you think your health depends on. And we came up with, you know, different descriptors here. So. My health depends on destiny, medication, therapy, therapist and psychiatrist, randomness, external factors, you, I mean yourself, brain chemistry, and genetic predisposition. Okay? Um, so we were trying to be as precise as possible, okay? Um, and also defining the interaction because the, the patient provider interaction is quite important. Okay, so we decided to separate therapy itself versus therapist and psychiatrist. Um, but we like to change names on psychiatrists, so we used to be activity therapist, we're now group therapist, or roster psych uh, psychotherapist. So in any case, something that we do often is to uh, give a chance to patients to experience the same group multiple times, for instance CBT, so for twice, the function three. And um, so a person might be very much in tune with the content of the group, but not, might not be in tune with the therapist because I could tell speaking the therapist as an accent. So we were trying to understand how much of the human element was determining the results. That was the first part. 